Commissioner O'Donnell, do you hear me okay? Commissioner O'Donnell, can you hear me? This is Patricia. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Loud and clear. Commissioner O'Donnell, are you on? Commissioner O'Donnell? Yes, sir, I'm present. All right, thank you. Good morning. Time is now 10.31 a.m. Today's date is Tuesday, January 24th, 2023. This is the time and place for the regularly scheduled Business meeting of the Montana Public Service Commission. We are in the Bollinger Conference Room at Montana Public Service Commission. I call this meeting to order. Would the my colleagues join me in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance? I All right, thank you, colleagues. Uh, I would note for the record that uh, Commissioner Pinocci, myself, Vice President Fielder, and Commissioner Bukacek are present in the Bollinger Room, and Commissioner O'Donnell is present online. So we do have quorum this morning. Uh, the Montana Public Service Commission welcomes public comment on any matter that's before the commission or any matter that's on the agenda for this morning. Is there any public comment in the room? Seeing none. Are there any public commenters online? Seeing none. Uh, we have no changes to the agenda this morning. So let's roll right into our action items. Action item number one is approval of the commission minutes for the week of January 16, 2023. Is there a motion? Mr. President, I move approval of the commission minutes for the week of January 16th. Is there a second, Commissioner Pinocci? All set. We have motion that's been seconded. Uh, Discussion on the minutes, changes, revisions? Seeing none, all those in favor of the Vice President's motion to adopt the minutes for the week of January 16, 2023, signify by saying aye. 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 All right, minutes are approved unanimously. Let's move into work session item number one. Work session item number one is docket 2021.04.053. This is commission initiated. This is our intervention rulemaking to consider extending the comment period on our intervention rulemaking, which would include holding a second rulemaking hearing on our commission's intervention rules, MAR 38-2-258, Mr. Hamilton. Thank you, uh, Mr. President and commissioners. Uh, as the president just mentioned, this does concern our intervention rulemaking. We had a public listening session on the proposed rules uh, earlier this month where we received no public comment. And that stands in stark contrast to the public comment that we received on the prior iteration of our intervention rulemaking. 
For shorthand, I'm going to refer to the prior intervention rulemaking, which was issued under MAR notice number 38-2-255 as the 255 rulemaking and our current rulemaking process, which is MAR notice number 38-2-258 as the 258 rulemaking. The uh, public comment period on our current rulemaking, the 258 rulemaking, closed on January 13th of uh, well this year. We have received no public comments on that rulemaking, um, either in person at the public hearing or in writing. Uh, staff is concerned that that might be due to some uh, confusion about what rulemaking the commission was considering on its intervention rules. The that new rulemaking, the 258 rulemaking, began at the exact same time that the rulemaking on, on the prior rule, the 255 rulemaking, ended. Uh, you'll recall the commission acted in one business meeting to approve the notice of decision stopping the old rulemaking and the notice of proposed rulemaking that began the new rulemaking. Staff is concerned given the disparity in public comment and, and public input between these two rulemakings that there was confusion uh, among people who are interested in this subject, uh, perhaps believing that they had already commented on the rulemaking when in fact we are in a different stage of rulemaking at this point. To uh, resolve that that confusion, uh, to provide, I guess, an ounce of prevention uh, instead of a pound of cure at a later date, staff does recommend that the commission extend the comment period on our currently pending intervention rules. Uh, that would involve a new written comment period and a new public hearing. So in the notice in front of you, the new public hearing would be scheduled for March 7th, 2023, and the extended written comment period would run through March 10th of 2023. I would say in addition to this, although it's not necessarily something the commission needs to approve, uh, I, I would offer that staff would work with the communications team at the agency to publicize this rulemaking more through some of the more conventional means of reaching the people that, that are interested in the commission, that is our social media presence and our website, uh, to try to, to make sure that we are covering all of our bases here and providing an adequate opportunity for public comment on this matter, which based on prior history was a matter of significant public interest. So at this point, uh, Mr. President, commissioners, the staff recommendation is to approve the draft notice that is in your meeting materials. That's a notice of second public hearing an extension of comment period on the proposed adoption and repeal, and to authorize staff to make any non-substantive changes to that notice that may be required for publication in the administrative register. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Mr. President Fielder. Mr. President, I move to approve the draft notice extending the comment period for MAR 38-2-258 and authorize staff to make non-substantive edits recommended by the Secretary of State. Is there a second? Bukacek is seconded. Discussion? Questions? Second. Um, Mr. President. Commissioner O'Donnell. Thank you. Uh, yeah, this is especially important, extending of this comment period uh, in light of the uh, quite a uh, mistaken impression uh, on the first round of this that the commission was attempting to um, uh, violate the principle of transparency uh, through this rulemaking when in reality uh, the commission and the staff were uh, simply trying to uh, simply trying to simplify and clarify the procedures uh, and uh, so I think it is uh, uh, illustrative, greatly illustrative of the length that this commission will go through uh, for a total transparency that uh, it is, uh, uh, we have determined that it's not satisfactory that we held a meeting and nobody uh, participated, uh, but the commission is greatly interested uh, in uh, acknowledging and listening to uh, all testimony on every important issue. So I thank uh, uh, staff uh, for uh, crafting this recommendation, and I heartily support it, Mr. President. Thank you, Commissioner O'Donnell. Additional discussion? Commissioner Vice President Fielder. Thank you, Mr. President. I was um, uh, surprised when uh, we attended the hearing and there was nobody that wanted to speak. 
And I thought this was a sign that uh, we had really gotten it right this time. But ha has staff received any kind of indication that there was confusion or is staff just trying to be um, overcautious or uh, abundantly cautious? Uh, Mr. President and uh, Vice President Fielder, I would categorize it more on the, the side of abundant caution. Uh, we had, as all commissioners are aware, substantial feedback in that prior iteration of the uh, intervention rulemaking. And to go from maybe the most active public comment rulemaking to the least active public comment rulemaking the commission has seen in the last year uh, is a signal to, to me at least, and, and I, I think to staff in general, that something was not understood in the in the transition here from the old rulemaking to the new. Thank you. Additional discussion, comments? Um, I would just reiterate everything that Commissioner O'Donnell said. I think he said it well and succinctly. And thank you, Commissioner O'Donnell, for your comments because you're right on the mark. Additional discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the vice president's motion signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed signify by saying no. Seeing no opposition, motion carries unanimously. Thank you, Mr. Hamilton. All right, let's move to work session item number two. This is DACA 2022.11.099. Montana Dakota Utilities Company, otherwise known as MDU. We're here to consider the application of MDU for authority to establish increased rates for electric service uh, and to act on their interim request. Mr. Fink or Ms. Umstead? Mr. Fink. Good morning, President Brown, Commissioners. As you mentioned to, before you today is docket 2022.11.099. Montana Dakota filed an application for authority to establish increased rates for its electric service with the commission on November 4th, 2022. In its application, Montana Dakota filed an interim request. I won't go into great detail. However, I want to provide some background with interim request in a general rate case proceeding. During the rate case procedure, there's testimony, intervener testimony, uh, discovery, briefing, hearing. It's a 270-day process or nine months. Staff has a, a vigorous process and abundant of information to make an informed decision. Interims are a little different. Generally, interveners don't comment on the interim. Staff can, however, look at statute and rules to make a decision. Both the rule and statute were included in your packet. The first Montana code annotated 69-3-304 is the statute regarding interim increases and decreases. It states that an order of the commission approving or denying a temporary rate increase or decrease shall be based upon consistent standards appropriate for the nature of the case pending. Next is administrative rule 38.5.506. Criteria for approval of request. This rule states, consideration of an application to increase rates on an interim basis in a general rate case proceeding, sorry, a general rate case increase proceeding will be guided by generally established principles of utility rate regulation. Okay. One of the generally established principles of rate utility rate regulation, there's a um, term out there in the regulatory world called the regulatory contract. It's recognized throughout the United States as a fair statement of the obligations of commissions and utilities when it comes to rate of return regulation. In general, the regulated company is allowed the opportunity, not a guarantee, to earn a fair return on its investment and is protected from competition. And in return, the company is required to provide service to all who need it and the services be of good quality, safe, and reasonably priced. And looking at the interim request, one of the things staff does is look at to see if the utility is earning a fair return. The return staff measures is the return to shareholders or also known as the return on equity. There are two seminal Supreme Court, Supreme Court decisions of generally established principles of rate regulation that strongly guide this commission's ROE decision, return on equity decisions. Um, I won't go into great detail about those decisions, however, um, when looking at MDU's financials, 
their 2020 and 2021 rate of returns were 5.29 and 5.52% respectively. Those figures are well below their authorized returns established in the previous electric docket 2018.09.060. So I'm going to turn over to Brooke for. Yes, thank you. Good morning, President Brown, Commissioners. Um, overall, with that background, staff recommends approving the requested interim revenue increase of $1,716,000. $219. This is approximately 16% of the overall request in its application. The average residential customer bill using 792 kilowatt hours per month would see an increase of $2.33 or 2.6%. As a reminder, customers' interim rates are refundable with interest if the commission ultimately approves permanent rates that are lower than the interim rates. And Thank you for your time today, and Grant and I are both available if you have any questions. Mr. Fink. President Brown, there's a one non-substantive change that needs to be made to the uh, interim draft order. It's on paragraph one, uh, line four, where it says revenue increase of 10, 10, um, 10, 10, sorry, the 10 point, 10 million, 499 million and $674. That last 674 needs to be changed to 415. Mr. Fink, I do have one question also about the draft interim order. Paragraph five, I just want to confirm that, I'm sorry, paragraph six, I just want to confirm that since the interim request reflects a 9.25% return on equity increase, that, that is correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Vice President Fielden. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I move that the uh, commission approve the interim rate Put forth in docket 2022.1109 and approve the uh, this interim order. Is there a second, Commissioner Bukacek? I second. All right. We have a motion that's been seconded. Discussion? Yes, Thank you, President Brown. So this is interesting. It's an interesting rate case because we were told that if we close the Sydney coal plant, uh, rates would come down. There was testimony that the Sydney coal plant was expensive, um, it was um, at a higher rate than energy that could be brought in from out of state through the MISO market. I heard testimony in this very room from the residents of Sydney and Savage that they didn't mind paying higher rates because they couldn't have the coal mine and Savage shut down to where they lose a tremendous tax base to the school. We lost jobs in Sydney, closing the coal plant down. Uh, we cannot tell the power company how to run their business. But when we listen to testimony and they say, we have to shut the plant down because it's not economically viable and we're gonna lower rates and they do so and they come back here for a rate increase, I'm struggling to how I'm going to explain this to the community after what they've been through. Thousands of miles were driven from community members to come here to testify. It took hours to listen to everybody. How am I going to explain that we shut this plant down to lower rates? We lost the jobs and the tax base, and now we're having a rate increase. How am I going to do that? So I'm not going to support this. I explained that we have an energy shortage in the Western United States, okay? Uh, we're struggling to get power. 
uh, we shut this plant down. We promise we're going to lower rates. And here we are asking for a rate increase. So my vote today is no. Thank you, Commissioner Pinochi. Commissioner O'Donnell. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, you know, I am going to, uh, I'm applying to uh, oppose the, the motion uh, for similar reasons to Commissioner Pinochi, but not the same necessarily. Um, I am, uh, I have several questions uh, relative to the, the amounts of the rate increase and the interim rate increase. I uh, appreciate greatly the information that uh, Grant uh, gave regarding the statutes and the reference to the under earning. And uh, I, uh, of course, we are bound to not uh, allow one of the utilities or force one of the utilities, I should say, into an under earning uh, capacity. Uh, I have uh, several questions about the amount of this particular uh, rate increase that's requested, even in the interim basis, recognizing that uh, it is refundable with interest uh, should the commission uh, approve a, a smaller amount than this. Uh, but uh, I, I'm just, there are so many issues, so many unanswered questions on my mind that I think it's uh, greatly premature uh, for myself to uh, vote to uh, allow this uh, interim rate increase, uh, Mr. President. Thank you, Commissioner O'Donnell. Additional discussion questions, Vice President Fielding. Thank, thank you, Mr. President. I hear the concerns of my colleagues loud and clear, and I, I support looking into um, this matter very carefully as a part of our the general rate case. Um, I will note that the requested increase uh, in the general rate case for MDU is uh, over 19%. It would be an over 19% increase. This interim rate that staff has recommended is a 2.66% increase, which I find reasonable given um, inflation and the increased costs of just about everything these days, uh, 2.66 seems um, very much within reason, but I do want to take a very hard look uh, in the general rate case at these other factors pointed out by my my colleagues here on the commission. Thank you, Vice President Fielder. Additional discussion? Additional discussion? Seeing none, I think we'll do a roll call vote on this matter. Commissioner O, well, I'm sorry, Vice President Fielder. Yes. Commissioner O'Donnell. No. Commissioner Pinochi. No. Commissioner Bukacek. Yes. And I will vote aye or yes. So motion carries three to two vote. Thank you, colleagues. Mr. Fink, Ms. Umstead. All right, work session item number three. This is legislative. Uh, this is time to discuss bills in the 2023 Montana legislature relevant to the PSC mission, statutory authority, administrative processes, and general agency concerns. Uh, may relate to PSC budget request presentation. We're here to consider staff analysis and recommendations and provide direction to you on the PA, PSC's response to various legislative bills. Mr. Rosequist. Good morning, Mr. President, commissioners. Good morning. Today, I'd like to go over uh, a few new bills that have popped up since last week's business meeting and give you an update on a couple of other bills. Um, I did distribute a memo uh, earlier this morning, um, and I'll use that kind of as the basis for this presentation. Um, but I'd like to start off with House Bill 191, which, as you recall, we did discuss last week, House Bill 191 would repeal uh, regulation of Class D motor carriers or garbage haulers. Uh, the commission um, did not um, take action to uh, support or oppose that bill last week. No motion was made. 
but that takes us to House Bill 278, which is another motor carrier bill. Uh, House Bill 278, sponsored by Representative Brad Barker, would uh, require garbage haulers to file rate schedules and rules of service with the commission. Uh, the commission was requested to provide a fiscal note on this bill, and staff developed a draft fiscal note uh, based on a financial impact of two additional FTE, uh, plus costs for rulemaking and publishing legal ads. Uh, the fiscal note is based on as, an assumption that the commission would use processes uh, to um, regulate the rates of garbage, caller, garbage haulers that are very similar to the methods and processes we use for other regulated industries. House Bill 278 had a hearing in the House Energy, Technology, and Federal Relations Committee yesterday. Lucas Hamilton attended that hearing um, as an informational witness. He was also, also there as an informational witness on House Bill 191 and uh, did a great job, by the way. Uh, the next bill I'd like to discuss is House Bill 284, which would revise Excuse laws. Me, uh, Will? Commissioner O'Donnell? Excuse me, Will. Is, yes. uh, uh, is it appropriate at this time to ask Lucas Hamilton to give some impression of the testimony on uh, 278 uh, that he witnessed yesterday? I think that's an excellent suggestion. Commissioner O'Donnell, Mr. Hamilton, would you come forward? Mr. Hamilton. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Commissioner O'Donnell, uh, were you looking for a summary of, of the questions that I received as a as a informational witness on behalf of the commission or a summary of the testimony provided by all the other witnesses that were there? I think uh, what I'm looking for, thank you, is a, a, a concise summary of uh, what some of the testimony was, the pro and con. Uh, I, I was very interested in some of the, uh, the uh, testimony on uh, House Bill uh, 191 and uh, uh, relative to um, the potential or probable uh, lack of service in rural uh, areas that uh, require uh, long distances. Uh, and so that was something that I hadn't really considered. And I wonder if there's any considerations of that in uh, House Bill 278 or anything related to that. I'm sorry I wasn't able to uh, remotely listen to the hearing, but I'm quite interested in the de deliberations on this. Uh, certainly, Mr. President, Commissioner O'Donnell, the proponents were, uh, I'd say, soundly outnumbered by the opponents on both of those bills. But the proponents uh, consisted of former uh, PSC Commissioner Roger Koopman, uh, Parker Noland, who is a uh, litigant, obviously, in the Noland lawsuit uh, opposite the commission in the state of Montana challenging the constitutionality of Class D regulation. Uh, Mr. Noland's attorney uh, was also present as a proponent, uh, and there was one additional proponent whose name escapes me at the moment on the uh, House Bill 191 to repeal Class D regulation. Uh, their, the thrust of their support for the bill was that the Class D regulation was outmoded, that garbage hauling is no longer a natural monopoly, and therefore no longer made sense for a body like the commission to regulate the entry into that particular market. Uh, and so they asked the committee to pass the bill uh, or send the bill at least to the floor uh, so that uh, the, the repeal of Class D regulation could move on. Uh, Mr. Brown, I believe is the name of the attorney for uh, Mr. Noland, also gave some remarks about how other states are proceeding with Class D regulation or the lack thereof, uh, garbage hauler regulation, I should say. And so uh, if the commission has any particular uh, questions or, or interest in how other states are moving forward with that, I would refer commissioners to the recording of the of the uh, hearing. Additionally, I believe that uh, Mr. Nolan and his attorney will be supplying the committee with additional uh, information after the, the close of this week, potentially before executive action next week. That would give a better description of how other states are proceeding with garbage hauler regulation. Uh, op opponents to House Bill 191. Uh, Mr. President, oh, 
Thank you. So go ahead, please. I'm sorry, Mr. President, I didn't hear that. that I didn't part. either. Commissioner O'Donnell, what'd you say? No, I, I thought he was done. He just started the the uh, opponents, and I, I'm sorry I interrupted uh, prematurely. There's about a five-second delay from my phone to what's going on there, so I apologize. Uh, uh, Mr. Hamilton, uh, please uh, continue. Uh, certainly, Mr. President, uh, Commissioner O'Donnell, the opponents were primarily garbage haulers themselves from every corner of the state, uh, testifying about how the system has worked for them over the, the past period of, well, forever, uh, that, that we've had Class D uh, garbage hauler regulation in Montana. Uh, attorneys also spoke on behalf of, uh, or professional lobbyists on behalf of the garbage hauling industry about the effect that the repeal of Class D would have on their property rights to a Class D license. So there was an argument presented that repeal of this section of code would amount to an unconstitutional taking or a taking that would require just compensation from the state to all those current garbage haulers who have, a, uh, in their estimation, a valuable license uh, to, to provide this service. Um, so as I mentioned at the front, the opponents significantly outnumbered the proponents of the bill. Of course, the commission, I appeared on behalf of the commission only in the capacity as an informational witness and questions from committee members primarily focused on the claims about the rate of return earned within the industry, claims uh, made by uh, former commissioner Roger Koopman, uh, by the existing garbage haulers who testified at that hearing, uh, questions for the commission concerned uh, primarily the process that we would use to evaluate a Class D application in Montana. So that is House Bill 191. Uh, the second bill, which dealt with rate regulation of Class D, uh, by that time the room had thinned out substantially, so fewer proponents involved, also a few fewer uh, opponents, but the, the lines were much the same where existing garbage haulers came in to oppose rate regulation of their industry, uh, arguing that it would be very burdensome, uh, both on the industry themselves and also the commission and its own staff. Um, I would note that the bill sponsor offered the second bill, the, the rate regulation bill, as an alternative to his preferred option of just deregulating entirely. His closing statement, I believe, is instructive that he doesn't necessarily think that it's a good policy for the government to be involved in, in regulation here. And so only if the government maintains some form of regulation by rejecting House Bill 191 would he encourage the committee to move forward with right regulation of Class D. Again, I only appeared as an informational witness, so my testimony primarily answered questions about the process the commission would apply in reviewing rate applications. Mr. O'Donnell? Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Yes, thank you. Uh, one other thing on here that is a little bit unclear to me, does 278 uh, assume and presuppose that none of the existing Class D regulations having to do with uh, 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 monopolistic uh, uh, licensing uh, of an area, does it presuppose that that stays the same? Uh, Mr. President and Commissioner O'Donnell, yes. Uh, I think that the sponsor would withdraw or kill the bill if House Bill 191 proceeded all the way through the process and was adopted into law because the two would be internally inconsistent at that point. House Bill 191 uh, would repeal yeah. the very definition of a Class D hauler, which would make rate regulation of them impossible. Uh, thank you. I have many more questions about the bill, but uh, not not at this time. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Hamilton, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Hamilton. Mr. Rosequist, would you like to proceed? Thank you, Mr. President. So House Bill 284 uh, is a bill that would revise laws related to approval of electricity supply resources. House Bill 284 is sponsored by Representative Jerry Schillinger. And this would be the pre-approval bill. Um, 
it is designed to address the uh, fourth district court's determination that uh, Montana Code annotated titles or 69.8421, the pre-approval statute, is unconstitutional as it applies only to a single entity, Northwestern Energy. So House Bill 284 would correct that by uh, modifying Montana Code annotated 69.8201 to make public utilities currently doing business in Montana as part of a single integrated multi-state operation that lies outside the Columbia River Basin, i.e. Montana Dakota Utilities, subject to the provisions of 69.8421, the pre-approval statute. So now you would have two, two the primary two utilities uh, providing electric electric service in Montana subject to the pre-approval statute. And then it makes another minor change to the pre-approval statute to eliminate references to a utility that removed its generation assets from its rate base uh, prior to October of 2007. So with those two changes, um, the bill would no longer apply to a single entity and that is considered to be a, a way to address the district court. Okay. Uh, Mr. Hamilton, just a clarifying question before I make a motion on this bill. Uh, is my understanding that the PSC is no longer a party to the litigation on pre-approval? Uh, Mr. President, the commission has not been participating in the appeal that is currently pending before the Montana Supreme Court. So, yes. All right, then my colleagues, I would move to have the commission monitor House Bill 284 and to provide uh, informational testimony if needed or requested. Second your motion, Mr. President. Motion's been seconded. Discussion? Mr. Panoji. Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. President. Do you see a benefit to the rate payer if 284 passes? And if so, what that benefit is? Mr. President, uh, Commissioner Panocci, uh, you know, in the past, uh, the commission has not been a fan of pre-approval. Um, there are... Uh, principles of regulation that would suggest that pre-approval can be harmful to ratepayers. There are two theoretical uh, bases for, for those arguments. One is called the moral hazard issue, where if the uh, regulatory agency is granting pre-approval, um, the utility's risk in making a decision uh, is reduced and therefore it may not be as diligent in making that decision. Uh, the second basis is that uh, there's an asymmetry in the information available to the commission and intervening parties compared to the utility. Uh, the utility will have more information about how the decision was made than the commission or the parties will be able to obtain through the contested case process. So those are the grounds on which uh, pre-approval tends to be disfavored by regulators. Um, there are counter arguments to that. In fact, one of them shows up in the testimony of um, uh, one of the witnesses in the rate case, uh, Carl Rabago, who talks about uh, the possibility that the commission can prevent an imprudent decision from being made uh, through, through pre-approval. Uh, so, I would say that um, there is the potential for harm. Uh, perhaps there's also the potential for benefits and which one would prevail would come down to how the commission prosecutes the, the cases before it in a, in a pre-approval application um, and how the commission ends up reaching the decision um, based on evidence gathered in those proceedings. Follow up, Mr. President. Mr. Panucci. MCC, are they testifying for or against this bill? And if so, why? And could this prevent lawsuits 
that the commission will have to deal with because if it does prevent lawsuits, that is a savings to the rate payer. Or is it possible that this will increase lawsuits? What are your thoughts there? Uh, Mr. President, Commissioner Ponochi, first, I don't have any information about what, if any, position the Consumer Council will have on this bill. Um, and I really can't speculate either on whether or not um, the bill will prevent or encourage lawsuits. Thank you, Mr. President. No more questions. Thank you, Commissioner Pinochi. Commissioner O'Donnell. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, yeah, uh, Will, I, uh, I, I'm very uh, sympathetic to uh, the arguments that you laid out in terms of for and against, and I'm, I'm very, very much uh, at, at the same place, I, I think. And that is that the uh, contention uh, of some uh, against the pre-approval was that it places all of the risk on, on ratepayers and, and uh, therefore absolving the utility from a great amount of risk and uh, honestly the centers uh, to do that in a, in a blanket fashion. Uh, I am uh, very interested in whether or not uh, the commission uh, has greater or lesser uh, control over the prudency of individual expenditures uh, by the utility uh, if under pre-approval or not. And uh, so I appreciate uh, the president's uh, motion to monitor this bill. Uh, I think uh, it should be monitored very closely and carefully and uh, I'm, I'm glad for the opportunity to share my concerns and would uh, uh, ask uh, anybody who uh, uh, has input on this to share that information with the commission or with me in particular, uh, Mr. President. Thank you, Commissioner O'Donnell. Additional discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of my motion to have the commission monitor the bill and provide informational testimony if needed or requested, signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, to signify by saying no. Seeing no opposition, motion carries. Uh, Mr. Rosequist. Thank you, Mr. President. The next bill I wanted to discuss is SB 178 to generally revise cryptocurrency laws. SB 178 is sponsored by Senator Daniel Zolnikov. It would prohibit the commission from establishing a rate classification for digital asset mining, digital asset mining businesses, or home digital asset mining that creates discriminatory rates. And the bill defines discriminatory rates as rates substantially different from other industrial uses of electricity in similar geographic areas. Um, I would say that uh, I have a couple of concerns with this bill, Mr. President, commissioners. Uh, one involving the definition of discriminatory rates because the bill would apply to home digital asset mining but then it defines discrimination in terms of other industrial uses of electricity, um, which may create a, a difficulty for the commission in um, you know, setting rates for, or evaluating rates for uh, cryptocurrency mining done in a residential household by comparison to industrial rates. Um, the other concern is just this idea. I don't generally, I would say that I don't know that it's necessary to define discriminatory rates. Um, I think it would be reasonable just to say um, that the commission can't create a classification for uh, cryptocurrency mining that's discriminatory and leave it at that. I think there's lots of case law surrounding discriminatory rates or non discriminatory rates in the regulatory arena, and we could rely on that. Um, as you are all aware, discriminatory 
rate making comes up in um, general rate cases anyway, and it also comes up in the PERPA implementation area. And um, the way this definition is written could could spill over and affect some of that some of that other regulatory activity. So I have a few concerns. Um, but I don't really have a recommendation on what you should do about it. Mr. Hamilton, I'd be curious if you have any opinion of this bill. I must confess this is the first time I was made aware of this legislation, so I'm a little bit puzzled by the intent behind it. Mr. Uh, Mr. President, I would agree with everything that Will said. Um, I, I think that the that it would be difficult from from a legal standpoint to address the non-discrimination element when you've got a residential customer theoretically receiving normal service under a residential rate who also provides, I guess, an industrial consumption of, or industrial load to the system through its use of uh, cryptocurrency mining. Um, yeah, so I, I would agree completely with everything Mr. Rosequist said. Mr. President Fielder. Mr. Mr. President. President, thank you. I'm inclined to have uh, the agency monitor this bill, and I see that it hasn't been scheduled for a hearing yet. Um, but if a hearing comes up quickly, I think it would be important to share that uh, concern that Mr. Rosequist expressed regarding the definitions. I know how important it is to get definitions correct in statute, especially pertaining to our uh, roles and responsibilities. Um, however, I know that it also takes a while for legislation to work through the legislature, and if we don't catch it right away, there's a chance to catch it on the other side if it passes the House and goes on over, or passes the Senate and goes on over to the House. So I am interested in um, pursuing, um, potentially pursuing an amendment um, along the lines that would address Mr. Rosequist's concern that he expressed to us, but I'd like to give us time to kind of flesh it out. Um, so for this, at this time, I just propose that we would monitor the monitor the bill uh, assign an informational witness and um, give that informational witness permission to express our concern over the definition. Is there a second? Second. All right. Discussion on the motion? Commissioner O'Donnell. Thank you. Uh, not necessarily on the motion itself, uh, but uh, I am interested in this thing uh, I have noticed in my review of uh, headlines, uh, short stories about uh, uh, how uh, utilities in the state of Washington in particular have uh, addressed uh, uh, digital mine, asset mining uh, sites because of the massive amounts of energy that they require. And uh, I would be very much interested in the proponents' views on this when that hearing is scheduled um, in that uh, uh, whether or not well what what the what the author of the bill intend what his intention is on, on this uh, uh, and what I'd be very keenly interested in is whether or not a uh, prolifer pro proliferation uh, more than exists now of data mining uh, uh, loads in, in the state would have on the utilities providing that power and uh, whether or not uh, uh, different rates uh, might address some of those concerns that the utilities uh, might, or co-ops, for instance, that matter, might might have. Uh, so I'm, I'm keenly interested in in uh, the arguments on this and look forward to that hearing. And I think that uh, it does warrant our uh, uh, our uh, monitoring this bill, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner O'Donnell. Commissioner Bukacek. I have a question for Mr. Rose, please. Yes, about the history, is there any history, any any precedent for having a, a kind of a preemptive prohibition of the, co of the commission from establishing a rate? Is there any history of that? Because to my knowledge, this doesn't come under our jurisdiction currently. 
Uh, President Brown, uh, Commissioner Bukacek, uh, you are correct that the statute does not currently address uh, a rate classification for uh, digital asset mining specifically. Uh, the commission is authorized uh, to approve rate classifications, um, and we have done that. Um, all utilities have various rate classifications, commercial, et cetera. Um, and so I understand this statute to be providing instruction to the commission that if you are going to set a classification for digital asset mining, the rates can't be discriminatory. And then it goes on to define what discriminatory rates are. Um, and I guess my view is that the commission is already obligated to ensure that rates are just and reasonable in, in Montana law's language. Other states use language that goes beyond just and reasonable and includes uh, not unduly discriminatory. Um, and you know it would be helpful for Montana law to have similar language, but I don't know that it's necessary with the, with the just and reasonable standard. Um, I think uh, ensuring uh, that rates are not discriminatory is part of achieving a just and reasonable rate structure. So that's why I think that this isn't necessarily a needed, a needed bill. But um, if we are going to be told not to or if we are going to be told to ensure that rate classifications for uh, specifically for data asset mining uh, should be constrained, I would want to do it in a way that adheres to the just and reasonable standard or that gives the commission some ability to account for uh, the cost of service when determining what that rate classification should look like. Um, and the way the definition is written here, I'm I'm concerned that it would impair our ability to do that. Excellent explanation. Thank you. Commissioner Bonacci. Vice President Fieler. Mr. President, I just wanted to um, explain my motion a little bit, and that is, um, given that we don't know when the hearing is, I wanted to authorize us to be engaged in this piece of legislation, but I would also like um, staff to develop, uh, flesh out the ideas on how to amend this um, to address this concern so that potentially if this isn't heard, if the bill's not heard by the next time we meet and consider legislation that we could actually uh, possibly pass a motion to amend uh, with some language, uh, proposed language that staff could prepare. So that's what I'm hoping that we can we can do for now is uh, monitor for now, be prepared to express concern for now. And then um, if we have time to go ahead and prepare um, an, or prepare a draft amendment for the for the commission to consider um, approving it the next the next time we meet on this uh, piece of legislation. Thank you, Vice President. Additional discussion? Uh, Mr. President. Commissioner O'Donnell. Thank you. Uh, I, I wanted to clarify <clears throat> some of my comments earlier, and that is that uh, should we discover, as I've been led to believe in the state of Washington, that there are some material and burdensome effects of major uh, load centers uh, uh, entering uh, a distribution system, that uh, if that's the case, then perhaps rates should be adjusted to reflect that burden on the utility and perhaps on the remaining uh, users of that uh, system. So I, I'm keenly interested, Mr. President. Thank you, Commissioner O'Donnell. Uh, I'm going to support this motion. Um, I'll just take my comments all the way back to the statement I made earlier. I'm, I'm, I am puzzled by what the purpose of this legislation is even intending to do. So I, I will watch with bated breath the uh, committee hearing to see what Senator Zolnikov has in mind. All right. All those in favor of the vice president's motion signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed signify by saying no. Seeing no opposition, motion carries. We'll monitor for now, but under the conditions that the vice president stated. Mr. Rosequist, House Bill 52. Uh, yes, Mr. President, commissioners, the last bill I wanted to discuss is House Bill 52, uh, sponsored by Representative Katie Zolnikoff. 
It revises common carrier provisions in Title 69 to eliminate uh, obsolete language. This is a bill that the commission requested that the Energy and Telecommunications Interim Committee grant pre-introduction to. Uh, the bill has passed the House on a vote of 96 to 2 and is now scheduled for a hearing in the Senate Highways and Transportation Committee on Thursday, January 26th. President Fielder. Mr. President, I think there's a couple other pieces of legislation we should probably discuss and um, get our position on the record. All right, go ahead. Uh, first one is House Bill 2. Uh, for obvious reasons, uh, I, I move that the commission support the, um, the portion of House Bill 2 concerning the commission's uh, budget request. I think it goes without saying, but I'm happy to entertain a motion on that. <laughs> you want to make a motion? I just did. Okay, I'll second. Discussion. <laughs> uh, seeing no discussion. Uh, all those in favor of us supporting our own budget, signify by saying aye. 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 And then. Um, aye. Motion, motion carries unanimously. Thank you, Mr. President. And then uh, similarly, I'd like to have us on the record supporting our element in House Bill 10, which is the funding for our READY project. And that is coming up for a hearing. So. Um, I want to be on the record that the agency is a proponent of our segment of House Bill 10 for the Ready Project. I make that motion. Uh, I'll second. Discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the Vice President's motion, signify by saying aye. 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 Mr. President, I'd like staff to aye. help us. I'm sorry. He was an aye. Motion he was carries. An aye. Yeah, okay. most carries. Uh, Mr. President, I'd just like to have staff um, make sure that they're tracking those two pieces of legislation and helping to keep us notified if there's any um, scheduling or hearings or anything like that, uh, any action on those pieces of legislation. Thank you. All right. Any other legislative matter, Commissioner Pinocchi? <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. President. A couple of questions on. In the last session, we had a bill to repeal the invasive species tax that is added to the electric bill. Is there any talk of the bill being introduced to do that? Also, there was a bill to add a tax to an electric bill since the invasive species tax was successful. Um, is there any rumor or any bill that looks like they may try to add a tax to an electric bill? And of course, what's very interesting is only Northwestern Energy has this tax. The other Companies that produce power or supply power in the state don't seem to have it. The rate payer is very concerned about this in my district. Um, what are your thoughts there? Uh, Mr. President, Commissioner Pinocchi, I can say at this point, I have not seen any uh, bill drafts or any introduced uh, legislation that addresses uh, the invasive species tax or, or uh, a tax on utility bills for that purpose. Oh, on Katie's bill, House Bill 52, has the commission made a motion to support that bill? And should we make a, a motion to, or maybe we already are supporting it? Uh, I, if I may, Commissioner Pinocchi, so House Bill 52 is one of our agency bills. We have four of them pending. Uh, if you'll recall back through the mess of time to summer of 2022, um, we as the commission met and uh, moved decided to move forward as a commission with four of our own bills. So we're already supporting that bill. All right, additional legislative discussion? Seeing none? Uh, Mr. President, Mr. President. Commissioner O'Donnell. Uh, thank you. You know, I don't have the bill number in front of me and my computer is not up right now, uh, but I believe the uh, uh, energy tax that uh, Commissioner Pinocchio referred to is uh, sponsored by uh, Senator Regeer. And uh, it has, a, as I understand it, it has a two-tiered uh, tax on uh, electricity generation and uh, renewable uh, generation. And I'm uh, quite puzzled as to what the purpose of, the, of that is and uh, being uh, generally of the of the position, uh, I think most of the legislature of uh, uh, being uh, 
uh, casting a negative eye towards any new taxes. Uh, I'm concerned about what the motivation of this bill is and uh, what effect it would have on uh, um, uh, rates uh, passing on to uh, to customers. So uh, whatever that bill is, I'd be uh, very, very interested in um, in all the particulars of, of that bill and for the commission following that, uh, Mr. President. Uh, thank you, Commissioner O'Donnell. I would just note that I don't believe that the bill you're referencing would address the a point that Commissioner Pinocchi was making, but we can certainly track, or well, not officially, but we'll certainly look into what um, Senator Aguirre bill does. Thank you. Additional legislative discussion. All right, if not, just a few announcements. Um, public, please note that uh, the status conference that was scheduled for Friday, January 27, 2023 at 10 a.m. in docket 2022.12107 has been canceled. Uh, also, the public should note that we are not holding a business meeting next Tuesday. Second, what is today? No, we are. Are we, are we have, do we have business meeting next Tuesday? <laughs> Okay, so scratch that. So our next commission business meeting is Tuesday, January 31st, 2022 at 9.30 a.m. Okay, that was my confusion as well. Okay, seeing no uh, further business coming before the commission, I will go ahead and the time is now 11.30 a.m. I'll go ahead and adjourn today's business meeting.